Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and start. So I, I'm giving the, uh, the, the meta introduction. <laughs> I'm just going to say a couple of words, and then uh, Donna's going to do the, the formal introduction. So uh, I'm, I'm really pleased, first of all, that you're all here, even though there's spring break and there's kind of a, a it seems that kind of a cruel advertisement for spring break uh, on, on the wall here. But if you have such beautiful displays, why do you need to go to the real thing? I'm not so sure, but so uh, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> so I am so pleased that uh, Professor Jason Lee is here to give us a colloquium today about um, collaborative environments and advanced technologies and visualization and, and whatever all you're going to talk about. I'm not, I haven't even looked at the title of your talk, but Jason's been a, a friend and colleague of NCSA uh, and of many people here, so many of you will know Jason and certainly of mine uh, in different places from, uh, from LSU and elsewhere uh, in different phases of my own career. Even probably when I was back at NCSA at the very early phases of my own career, I think we, yeah. So, so we've overlapped many times, and and we are very interested here in developing uh, collaborative environments uh, for the scientific communities that we support. And I've been thinking a lot about it. We've been having a lot of discussions with groups across campus from the College of Education, College of Engineering, and others. And, and Jason's visit is sort of designed not only to sort of give us an idea of what's going on at the very leading edge of technology in this space, but also to help catalyze discussions uh, across the campus. And so I'm glad you're here. We'll have the reception afterwards, and we'll continue on with discussions in different venues that we've set up for Jason. And I will let Donna then do the formal introduction. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Jason Lee. We have collaborated with Jason and his lab for many, many years since, gee, before the Alliance days at NCSA uh, with EVL and AVL. Uh, Jason Lee is the director of the LAVA Lab, the Laboratory for Advanced Visualization and Applications, and professor of information and computer sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He is also director emeritus of our friend and sister uh, uh, UIC lab, the Electronic Visualization Lab, and the Softwares Technologies Research Center at UIC where he maintains appointments in computer science and communications departments. In the past, he has held research appointments at Argonne National Laboratory and the, here at the NCSA. His research expertise includes big data visualization, virtual reality, high performance networking, video game design. He is a co-inventor of Cave 2 hybrid reality environment and SAGE, which we have used uh, a lot in the past, the Scalable Adaptive Graphics Environment Software, which has been licensed to Mechdyne Corporation and Vadiza Corporation, respectively. In 2010, he initiated a new multidisciplinary area of research called Human Augmentics, which refers to the study of technologies for expanding the capabilities and characteristics of humans. His research has also received numerous press from news media, including AP News, The New York Times, Popular Science's Future Of, Nova Science Now, NSF Science Now, PBS, and Forbes. Lee also teaches classes in software design and has been teaching video game design for over 10 years. In 2010, his video game design class enabled the University of Ch Illinois at Chicago to be ranked among the top 50 video game programs in the U.S. and Canada. Please welcome Jason Lee. Thank you for the introduction. Okay. Um, aloha, I should say. And I got to do one of these because that's part of the contract. <laughs> um, I've only been in Hawaii for about a year and a half. I spent 22 years of my life in Chicago, so I understand snow and polar uh, vortexes. And I always joke about uh, moving to Hawaii by saying, you know, I used those supercomputers at NCSA to predict that, vo that polar vortex so I could get the hell out of there in time. <laughs> But I didn't, actually. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, in case you're interested, this is Hawaii. 
And the campus I'm on, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, is the mothership campus, the flagship campus, and it's located right here. It's literally five minutes away from Honolulu uh, downtown. But in fact, the, the, the university itself is spread across all the islands of Hawaii. There are campuses all over. And part of what we're trying to do, and we'll talk about that in a little moment, is to start to connect these together so that students are able to take advantage of all the exciting research that's happening in, uh, in the main campus as well as in, in the mainland. So quick few words about lava. Uh, you know, one of the things I learned from being a director of EVL is that you, you gotta be good at coming out with acronyms. And this was the first one I came when I, when I interviewed for Hawaii and they thought, oh, he's a keeper. <laughs> um, so the lab is literally only a year and a bit old. Um, we have a number of NSF uh, projects that are funded now. Uh, I won't be able to talk about all of them. Maybe you'll have to invite me to come back or you can come visit me to, for a little demo. Uh, one of which is uh, advanced visualization instrumentation, which we'll talk about in a moment, data visualization middleware, uh, automatic translation of natural language queries into visualization. So this is kind of like the, uh, the stuff you see on Iron Man and Star Trek where you talk to the computer and it would just make the picture, right? That's the goal. Panoramic 3D video capture, that's with uh, UC San Diego as well as Scripps Institution of Oceanography and uh, EVL back in Chicago. And then more recently, um, I will be uh, monitoring and network, uh, visualizing all the network data generated by NSF's IRNC program. Um, Hawaii is well known for its oceanography and its astronomy, and so it makes sense that I would spend a lot of time collaborating with these folks. So I'm just starting to work with Dave Carl and Brent Tully, some of whom you may, you may know. Uh, but we also have uh, film and media as one other strength. A lot of uh, Hollywood, you know, Hollywood films are still actually filmed in Hawaii, like Hawaii Five-0, obviously. Um, and so we're actually training students to be part of that, that, that ecosystem of capability. And we have folks in, uh, in Indiana, Jennifer Schaff in Indiana, and John Meyer, who I started working on with the Department of Indo-Pacific Languages and Literature. I have a sort of private little interest in Samoan language and culture, so I, I can speak Samoan to some degree. Uh, maybe I'll unleash it on you a little bit later. If I, if, but then you can't criticize because you don't know it, so which is cool. Anyway, so let me talk a little bit about visualization and what it is. I know some of you are aware of this term, but some of you may not be. So visualization is basically about turning data into imagery for the purposes of insight. And the reason, me personally, and why visualization researchers spend so much effort on this is because Half of your brain is dedicated to the processing of visual information. If you can think about any human sense that's probably the most important to you, think about sight, hearing, touch, taste, one would argue that being able to see something is probably the most important thing, right, in order to survive in the world. And that's why evolution has designed it so that you have so much machinery for doing that in your head. So as a visualization researcher, I would argue that if you're not using visualization to try and understand a problem, you're not using half of your brain <laughs> to try and solve it. So let's go out there and, and do some visualization. So when we were growing up as you know, kids in science class and we were looking at uh, specimens under the microscope, right? the microscope was the lens through which we understood science or the telescope, right? Today, these modern lenses are our computer displays. Everything is ending up on the computer, you know, gathered from sensors, processed on supercomputers so that we can uh, look at it. And this is a, there's a great picture by Paul Bonington at Monash University that sort of has the same analogy where you have the traditional microscope. On the bottom, you have the light source, which is basically your instrumentation that's gathering the data. Then you have the supercomputer centers that are basically filtering that data down. So just like these little you know, magnification dials that you can twist on, right? And then at the top end, you've got the actual lens for viewing all this data, the, the immersive virtual environments for looking at all this data. And all this stuff is big data eventually reaching 
the, 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 the end users out there. So my career has been really focused on the building of better lenses. And we, I firmly believe that the quality of this lens can really determine the quality of your insight. Excuse me. I'll just pause it right there. It's not Hawaii, though. <laughs> and so here's a, here's a fun analogy I like to use to sort of express that idea. So uh, some of you may have heard of Percival, Percival Lowell. He you know, created the Lowell Observatory in, in Flagstaff, Arizona. And through that eyepiece, he saw you know, pictures of Mars, and he started drawing them. And, and he saw these little connection points between these little nodes. And he... And then he and the press sort of hypothesized that, in fact, those things were actually made by space aliens as, as uh, irrigation channels between these nodes. And this was, let's see, that was 1895. And if you sort of look back in history, it literally took NASA 70 years to actually prove that was not the case by launching something with enough resolution to actually see what was out there. So it was 1970 that Mariner went out there to take a look. So the, the this quality of your lens can determine your insight, is what I'm suggesting. And today, of course, we are continuing to build bigger lenses, some of which you have may have heard of and are processing their data. Right here is the LHC. It's a nine billion dollar lens. <laughs> or data gather, or light source. And then in, in Hawaii, we have approval now to build a, a $1 billion 30 meter telescope, right? So hold that, keep that idea in mind as I, as I talk about these things, and, and in a moment we'll, we'll return to these. But for now, let's take a little step back. And the issues I'm trying to deal with with these lenses is how do we allow scientists to deal with big data uh, using these higher resolution lenses. So in order to do that, um, I just want to show you a few fun pictures of how people, humans, who don't use a lot of computing deal with big data. <laughs> and it may actually surprise some of you that many NSF program managers have offices that are paper-based. <laughs> um, this one is, is, a, is a fun one. This is an English novelist. And he actually has the same data fusion problem. He's trying to tell a detective story, right? There are all these clues that he has to integrate in order to tell a compelling story, right? And so he has, if you go to that website and, you, and he has photographs of his office, every part of it is covered with these little post-it notes. And he's trying to figure out, well, what happened here? What should happen here first? So he can write this compelling story. Big companies do this too. This is how Northwest Airlines and Delta Airlines merged. Big sheet of paper, lots of post-it notes. You've got timeline across the top. And then each of these colored notes are for different tasks that have to be done in certain order in order to, you know, in order for the merge to occur. Uh, anyone drive a fancy European car like a BMW or a Volvo or, a, or an Audi or anything here? Or a, we'll admit to it? Okay, so here's BMW. <clears throat> BMW has something called the Wall of Inspiration. And what they do is they have this giant board where they post pictures of uh, car designs, fashion, and architecture over time. And you think, well, why do they care about fashion and architecture? Well, it's because the car is never seen as a unit by itself, but in the context of what people are wearing at the time and you know, in that period, as well as the backdrop around which they are appearing in. So they're not just thinking about the car, but they think about the entire ecosystem in which the car uh, you know, uh, moves in. And so by doing this, they can sort of start seeing trends in architecture design, in fashion design, so that their, car, their cars are designed in a way that sort of somehow matches this or leads this, right? Okay, let's turn to science a bit. So in 2008, 2007, 2008, I started working with folks at the Antarctic Drilling Program. This is how they dealt with big data. 
So these guys are the kinds of people who go out to Antarctica, drill for cores, just like in that film with Al Gore in Convenient Truth. They will slice through the core, scan the data, and print it out on sheets of paper, which they will then roll along their offices. And this gentleman here, he's a research scientist, he is scrolling along the floor writing notes on the sheets of paper. Then he gathers all these sheets of paper and he puts them together and types it into the computer. This is not 1980, this is 2007. Okay. Uh, in the movie industry, uh, many of you have probably seen pictures like these, like these where teams of artists, movie creators, are gathered to try and you know, figure out how to do this new movie. These are like brainstorm rooms where you have pic you know, pictures and storyboards. This is, um, oh, what's his name? Who did Superman, the new Superman film? Um, and 300, whatever. Anyway, so out of all these, what kind of common behaviors can you start to look to, you know, to start to emerge? One thing we, you know, we sort of notice is that when people are dealing with large amounts of data, they like to spread all this information out. So they get this big picture view of things. They like to organize information in a variety of different ways, for example, spatially. They like to create linkages between all this data. And then large teams are actually really needed to solve these problems. And it's been shown that when you have put these large teams together to solve these problems, they actually can do them in two and a half times faster than individuals because you have access to people, you have access to data right in front of you. And then you have to make this information as persistent as paper. And that's part of the power of this. Imagine you guys are solving a problem intently together in a room that's dedicated to your project for months at a time where all this information is around you. Right? It makes sense that you're gonna solve this problem a whole lot faster than, than sitting alone in your office. Right. So in 2000 was when I started doing this research and out here in Illinois at the Trek Center in DuPage County uh, with funding actually from NCSA, I built something called the Continuum. This was based on much older technology. Uh, we had a 3D screen, we had access grid for video conferencing, multi-site video conferencing, and we had a tile display for higher resolution content. And we did some user studies. We found that when people work in these environments, they actually work faster because they are able to parallel process things together. Like they can see if someone's doing something, they don't have to do something redundant by, by repeating something. They found, we found that when, once you expose people to these kinds of environments, it, it, it feels really weird to go back to a smaller working environment. You felt almost claustrophobic. Has anyone experienced this with like going back to look at an old Macintosh, the first generation Macintosh? I remember the first time I saw this old, old Mac after you know, 15 years of it. I literally went and looked around to see if I could see more pixels on the edges because it was so small. You know, how could we have worked in that space? So this was the same phenomenon that was occurring in this continuum. So we began to experiment with these ideas more by building even bigger screens. Uh, this is the first 100 megapixel display that was built in Chicago. And then when we were starting to do this, we started realizing that there was no software, there was no middleware to drive these kinds of displays for actual practical scientific use, apart from you know, lots of cool demos. So what we did was we decided, okay, we have to figure a way to use this um, as a normal research tool for us. We have to eat our own dog food or else we're not gonna be able to convince anyone else to use this stuff. So this is a photo taken of one of our technical meetings, a real photo taken from one of our meetings. You have students gathered around, as well as faculty and postdocs, and with their laptops, they're able to push their screens directly onto the wall, multiples of them, throw content on it so they can have weekly discussions about their research. And this was back in 2004. Fast forward to today, I'm gonna show you a little bit of video about what it's like to work in these kinds of environments. Uh, this, was, this video was produced about a month ago based on the, the new SAGE uh, uh, research that we're doing to drive these systems. Um, and we just got a new grant from NSF to continue this for the next five years. So I'm gonna show this video.
<clears throat> Sage, the scalable adaptive graphics environment, was software we developed 10 years ago that allowed teams of users to manage information in rooms covered with displays as if it were one seamless canvas. The goal was to make it possible for people to look at large amounts of information and to come to conclusions with greater speed, accuracy, comprehensiveness, and confidence. With funding from the National Science Foundation in 2008, we were able to help over 100 institutions around the world build their display walls <coughs> using SAGE. SAGE 2, the scalable amplified group environment, is the next generation of the SAGE software, rewritten from the ground up using new and emerging technologies. The user interface has been completely redesigned to make it easier and faster for users to work on very large display walls. We have replaced traditional desktop monitors with high-resolution Sage 2 displays. Now you can have your own Sage 2 wall in your office or even in your home. The new interface emphasizes transportable interfaces rather than stationary interfaces. You can control Sage 2 from anywhere in the room or even remotely. You can manipulate information simply by using your web browser. You can drag and drop documents into the browser to send them to the wall. Once they're on the wall, you can move them around freely. You can also point and interact with information on the wall. In fact, several people can interact with the wall at any one time. It's completely democratic. You can push laptop windows or even entire laptop screens onto the wall, all via the browser interface. Sage 2 display walls can collaborate and send documents between one another by simply dragging and dropping. You can also mirror documents and their arrangement between walls. Remote viewers can follow your on-screen actions and interact with the data in real time. While the first Sage was written in C++, Sage 2 is written entirely in JavaScript. In fact, by using JavaScript, the Sage 2 display wall simply runs inside several synchronized Chrome web browsers. We have developed a small JavaScript toolkit to let you modify your applications to also work seamlessly across multiple displays. Sage 2 even accommodates 3D WebGL applications. Sage 2 will make it easier to deploy large information display walls and develop new applications for them in the future. The applications for this new, data-intensive way of working are potentially limitless. So what's the most exciting thing about this for us was being able to move to a JavaScript environment, uh, which meant that uh, you, just had a, you just had to have a browser to, get to, you know, to use Sage and to deploy it. Uh, we, we spent a whole lot of time trying to deploy this stuff to end users, and it was a whole lot of work to install these binary codes and all this kind of stuff. And you know, leveraging browser technology has been a godsend. And we weren't able to do that really until the past three years maybe two years, because the browsers were not powerful enough to do that until recently. Now, the visualization community is starting to realize, oh, we, should, we now have the ability to actually move all our visualization into a browser-based platform, which means that you can look at your visualizations on your iPhone, you can control big walls on your iPhone, you can send documents. So just as one of these little experiments I did to test this out and to make Chicago very annoyed at me, I, went, I drove around Honolulu taking pictures, and I went, oh, upload to Sage, upload this. And it was getting sh uploaded directly onto the wall in Chicago uh, live. You're going to find yourself blocked pretty soon. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> blocked pretty soon or, or, or unliked on Facebook. So, so let's, let's go a little deeper than that. Let's look at what you can do with all this resolution. And, and that's really a key part of it. This is a project that we worked on with Monsanto. Uh, Monsanto came to us having reviewed all the data visualization tools available on the market. And they said, we want a clean state slate approach to genomic visualization because we haven't seen anything that can do what we want, which is a lot of comparative genomic data visualization, comparing on the orders of hundreds of thousands of genes simultaneously. So we work with them to develop this tool. Uh, Jillian uh, um, Orisano, who's a, uh, a MS student, uh, formerly with a biology background, now doing computer science in, in Chicago, she developed this tool called GenoSage, and she's able to juxtapose hundreds of genes uh, in rows and color code them in ways that allow your eye to find patterns very quickly. And the nice thing about having all this resolution is you can see high-level patterns 
the context, but you can also get in really close and start to look at the details to the point that you can click on something to get the information that you want. Right? And it's a completely naturalistic interface to be able to do that. <clears throat> Sage walls are really good for supporting data-rich collaboration. It's a way to get the stuff off your laptops into this wall space so that you can start discussing them. Right? We all have about, what, four to seven things we can hold in our heads at, at one moment in time. Think of this as a tool for externalizing your working memory, right? Getting your stuff in your head out onto this, the wall. Imagine if, a whole, if all of you were to throw information up on the wall and you had a brainstorm session where you had to try and organize all these ideas, right? There's no better way to do that than using a large canvas, right? Maybe even post-it notes is better than just sitting in a small desk or on a small screen. This is one gentleman I met in, um, at Stanford, and he did a lot of very high-resolution posters uh, funded by the World Health Organization to try to explain to politicians the ramifications of various uh, policy decisions. So in this particular case, it was about uh, you know, nuclear waste disposal. If we went in one direction, this is what would happen. If we went in another it, this is a <coughs> and because the issues are so complex, right, the, the only way to tell it was to create this giant poster that was so large that you had to read very carefully to see how the story was evolving. It's like a giant long comic strip. So when he saw this medium, he said, oh my gosh, where have, we, where have you been? You know, I've, come, I've had this idea for, for 30 years, but no technology to display it on. And so he came over to Chicago, and he, he was having a great time. So, so these are just anecdotal things, but more and more we are finding researchers in computer science who are doing research on how people perform uh, better or worse in these environments. So we know how to sort of recommend uh, this technology for specific applications. So here I cited a few people, uh, in fact, if you want to go back for a copy of these slides, I've included all the references which you can look at later. <laughs> um, but the key points are these technologies, these high resolution display technologies can, read, can, can allow you to see detail and context simultaneously. They externalize your working memory. They increase parallel performance. In other words, all of you can work at the same time if you have the right tools. It improves location memory of information. Some of you probably are familiar with this. You know, you, 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 have, you might have a really messy office by, by most standards, but you know exactly where things are, right? Because you have location memory. You know, and when someone moves something or cleans your office, right, you're like, like in a fit because you've just, they've just disrupted your entire organizational structure, right? It reduces gender performance differences. That was an interesting one. They did a study about this, and they found that with larger screens, it, would, it helped uh, women navigate better in virtual environments. Uh, perceptual scalability. Um, you know, how do you allow someone to continue to be able to interpret large amounts of data as it continues to grow? How can you leverage high resolution environments to be able to, to solve that problem? And they found that, in fact, increasing screen resolution and size helps. And also, it, in, it encourages people to start to see the bigger picture in the thing, in the data that they're looking at. Not just at the minutia, but start to, to try and figure out what are the underlying stories that are emerging from looking at the data. And, they, and do it with greater confidence. So all these are, are, are references that I you know, encourage you to look into, and you can dig into them here for fully cited. And so let me go back now with more concrete stories even than what I just told you here, as well as the research studies. So remember the, the, the poor gentleman on the floor uh, with the sheets of paper? So we approached NSF to try and solve this problem. And we started some, a project called the Core Wall, which is how do we use these high resolution technologies to help this core com community? And so we developed a piece of software called Core Wall, which is now part of NSF's uh, JOID's resolution drill ship. So every core that's extracted can be scanned and annotated and visualized right there 
so that if you need to go in and drill another core, you can do it rather than go home and discover, oh, we missed something. And we know it's very expensive to go out on a, on a, on a ship expedition just to drill something, right? And so uh, for Andrill, for the Antarctic folks, this was so, so successful that in one of their expeditions, they decided to build five of these systems and ship them all to Antarctica so that they were scanning, annotating right there as they were drilling. And this is a larger version of it uh, with higher resolution using Mac screen. This is all back in now 2009 period, in fact. So a little more anecdotal information, which you can't read, so I'm going to blow it up. These are two pieces. I'll show you one of them. This is from Sean Higgins, director of uh, marine operations at, uh, at Columbia University. He says, you know, the earth sciences in, partic uh, in particular spend a lot of time or a lot of effort examining lots of physical specimens and spatial relationships. And ability to put them together in a visual environment is a tremendous advantage. Actual real estate, graphical tools make a difference in how well and quickly you can evaluate this, this material or situation. So, you know, for me as a computer scientist, I still have to somehow advance computer science research. And so working with uh, Sean and the Corwell community was an opportunity to take all my most cutting edge and fun research ideas and then apply them to really practical applications to start, start to understand, you know, where does this stuff really benefit someone? Where does it break? How do we improve it? Right? University of Michigan started taking our technology and propagating around the campus. This is in the Atmospheric Sciences Department where they built a tile display. This is as far back as 2008 now, I think. And these are you know, simulations of weather or uh, atmospheric science simulations that they would run you know, either weekly or daily and then they would just project it onto this wall so that if you wanted to come in for lunch, you can sit and have lunch and look at data. Or if you want to hold a class in there, you can do that too. And this is how, and, and the reason why they were attracted to using this technology was in fact, they were used to doing this before, but in a different way, right? Uh, basically, they had one grad student print sheets of paper every morning and, and pin them up. And if you wanted an animation, you would pin a stack of these and flip through them, right? And this was 2008. So we, we realized we had a lot of work to do in, the, in these communities. Um, and then it kind of got a little bit out of control. Uh, TAC, Texas Advanced Supercomputer Center, decided they want to build a bigger one than anybody else ever had because they had oil company money. Uh, <laughs> this is a th the first 300 megapixel wall, and then UC San Diego couldn't stand for it, so Larry Smart had to build a 301 million pixel wall. Um, this one is at UC San Diego. Uh, and this is built, this facility is built by my former advisor, Tom DeFonte. And what's unique about this is that he built these as modules in road cases so that if you had to deploy them, you could. But if you wanted to bring them home and make a big room, you could also do that. We call them optiportables after a project that we developed. I mentioned Monsanto. So uh, the first display wall uh, was built uh, in Bangalore, India, in Monsanto. Now, Three of the other Monsanto uh, locations in the U.S. Uh, also have these systems. Uh, for me, and probably for Ed, too, uh, we spend a lot of time doing this, <laughs> writing grant proposals. And for us, grant proposals, oh, this is our next secret grant proposal. You shouldn't look at that. Uh, for us, grant proposals are becoming a big data problem, too, right? Um, if you have, even though you had a 15-page limit, you have hundreds of pages of information you have to somehow condense down into a compelling story, right? It's no different from a visualization problem. How do you take all this data and produce a compelling or meaningful image, right? So what I do when I have research meetings with my team back in Chicago is I will bring my faculty in, I will put up the solicitation, I will put up the budget, I will put up drafts of the of the proposal, and we would sit and work and look at all this information at the same time. Like I said, eat our own dog food. So 
as I, as I said, in, in Hawaii, we're trying to do the same thing. Uh, there are lots of little campuses in Hawaii that don't have the expertise that we do in the main campus in, in Manoa, but also campuses all over the US. And they need conduits to allow their faculty to connect to other faculty, other researchers around the world. So I've been building these things called cyber canoes, so we can frame it correctly for Hawaii, uh, which stands for Collaboration, Analysis, Navigation, and Observation Environments. And in Hawaii, we have a saying, uh, the island is the canoe, and the canoe is the island. Okay? And this sort of goes back to sort of Polynesian days. Uh, you know, when the Polynesians sailed to, uh, to, uh, to America, right, they had to live on this vessel for that long a period of time and survive. And so that canoe became their island, right? And the island is their canoe. And so part of the mantra in Hawaii is we all have to learn to get along and collaborate. And so that's why that, that's used you know, so often when you, when you visit Hawaii. So um, with continuing funding from NSF, uh, we were able to go you know, from a mere uh, few tens of displays back in, what, 2008-ish, to today, where we're up to about uh, ooh, 150, 160 sites. And the internationals are being really aggressive uh, in this. Here are all the sites we've collected since the fall of 2014. Maxine Brown has been collecting these. And since we released the Sage 2 beta software, we've been getting lots of uh, new hits from actually even companies that are interested in this. A lot of it is because this technology has gotten to a point where it's gotten so cheap uh, that people can prop up these systems very quickly. And, and I'll speak about that in a few seconds, too. All right. So some of you may or may not know, you know, I, I came from a virtual reality cave background, right? The cave was this cool virtual reality room projected with 3D computer graphics, kind of like the holodeck on Star Trek. It was a million dollar statement, right? And, but I spent a lot of time developing these collaboration environments. And so it occurred to us that we still want to be able to benefit from these virtual environments, but within these kinds of data-rich environments somehow. And so that's where the Cave 2 came in. So back in around 2012, uh, I developed the Cave 2 with a colleague of mine, Andy Johnson, who's now in Chicago. And let me show you a quick video of it so you get a feel for what it's like to be in this Cave 2. Journey into space. Explore bundles of nerve fibers in a human brain or fly through a bridge before it's built. This is Cave 2, located at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Eight-foot walls of video screens envelop a viewer in a 3D virtual world. The first cave was built in 1992. They've been improving it ever since. So the scientists can stand in here and fly through these nanoscale structures. With support from the National Science Foundation, Computer scientist Jason Lee and his team developed Cave 2 here at the Electronic Visualization Laboratory, or EVL. We have an array of 72 LCD panels that are capable of displaying stereoscopic 3D. It interfaces with 36 computers and using a head tracker, the computer figures out what you're looking at and draws the correct computer graphics image onto the displays to create the illusion that objects appear to float in the room with you. Psychiatrist Oloshala Ajalori uses Cave 2 to analyze brain scans. He's looking at bundles of nerve fibers to see how damage to these tiny structures might lead to depression. So it's been really exciting to be able to visualize the fibers, walk around the brain, look under, between fibers. So there were entire missions where the sonar was mounted on the front. Mm -hmm. Cave 2 is helping environmental scientist Peter Doran dive deep under the Antarctic ice sheet. He's analyzing depth measurements from sonar on a robotic submarine. 
Each ball represents one measurement. Some of those balls are floating way up above the other balls, so that's bad data that we need to go in and, and get rid of. One thing we did talk about was, was integrating these. So. Exactly. Using software developed at the EVL called SAGE, researchers can share data with remote Cave 2 sites over high-speed networks. Trying to make it easy for people from multiple disciplines to work together, to look at their information, to come to scientific discoveries faster and easier. This is a kind of visual instrument to help the human brain make sense of large amounts of data. Hollywood has been eyeing the cave technology for years. One Trekkie researcher at the lab designed this virtual model of Star Trek's Starship Enterprise. You might say Cave 2 is taking visualizations where no one has gone before. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. So as, you, as the video mentioned, this facility is in Chicago, saying you're not too far from Chicago, I believe. So make a trip down there and take a look at it. So um, I'm going to zoom ahead a little bit. The, the next few slides are basically explaining how the Cave 2 technology works. Uh, the displays that you saw in that, in that room are not just standard displays that you buy from your local store. We actually did some cost, custom design of them. And then there's a manufacturer now that actually manufactures them for people who want to replicate them. So the, the NASA Endurance example uh, bears some discussion. So this, this is the work of Peter Dorn, and uh, the interesting is Peter Dorn is actually now at LSU. <laughs> he uh, recently moved there. Uh, Peter, this is Peter and his team in the Cave 2. So what they did was they spent three days in the Cave 2. Now in the old cave, that was unheard of. In the old cave, you spent maybe 15 minutes looking at something and you went home. In the new cave, because it was 26 feet wide, and it was so bright, you can leave the lights on in the room, you can bring in desks and laptops, and now you have the ability to juxtapose 2D information and stereoscopic 3D information. You can finally you know, have your cake and eat it too. It's a meeting room. And where this points to is that someday these display technologies are going to get so cheap that, in, in fact, you know, you're going to be starting to wallpaper your rooms in your offices with these kinds of displays. This is the uh, uh, work of my postdoc, who's now here in Hawaii for, uh, with Argon, basically doing a supercomputing uh, visualization of uh, nanoscale structures, and you're flying through those in great detail. Uh, in Chicago, they teach a data visualization class inside the Cave 2, where students can throw their homework assignments up there for discussion. Right. So Cave 2s are about, if you buy it commercially, it was, it's $1.7 million. It's, so it's still pretty darn expensive. And when we built it, it was $900,000. So it's still pretty expensive. So is, is the return on investment worth it to have something that expensive, or should you buy something cheaper? I mean, that's you know, a very practical question a lot of people ask. So, let me sort of, sort of rephrase this in a way that is sort of relevant to uh, you know, high-performance computing researchers, perhaps, but also has sort of real-life analogies. So my real-life analogy sort of goes back to the, the, uh, the auto manufacturers. So uh, is anyone familiar with the Le Mans race every year in France? So Audi is a big participant in this, and Audi's won, I don't know, in the past... 10 years of this race, I found out that Audi spends $125 million a year, a year, just to whiz three of these cars around this track for 24 hours. That's it. And you're wondering, why does Audi bother? Why spend so much? Is it just for the publicity, right, or the fame, or, or what? Well, as it turns out, they do they do this exactly for the same reason that we do this in the high-performance computing world. We go to supercomputing, we go to conferences like supercomputing, where you have a younger Ed Seidel back in 1998, right, and Ian Foster back in 1995, right, taking the highest-end technologies at these, to these conferences to work them to death to see what breaks so we can learn about them. 
because eventually, by learning from using these high-end capabilities, which are not available to everyone yet, uh, for Ian, for example, this is the birth in 1995. This thing he called the IPOP machine was the birth of grid computing, in fact, right? And by doing this, you eventually would distill capabilities that could be trickled down to everyday systems. And this is exactly why Audi does the same thing. They take their turbochargers and they run it for 24 hours. If it doesn't break, hey, we've got something pretty darn successful here, right? And then we can start, over time, putting these technologies like four-wheel drive, quattro, turbo diesel, right, uh, into the regular consumer car fleet, right, so the consumers can benefit from them. So for computer scientists, that's what cave twos are like to us. You know, for computer scientists, the $9 billion LHC, well, our $1 million cave is exactly that. It's an instrument so that we can really see far into the future and invent things that will someday become things that are cheap as the cyber canoes for $50,000 to $7,000. Okay. And that pretty much concludes my talk. Um, happy to answer any questions, and here are some websites for you to, if you're interested, grab a copy of the Sage 2 software or come check us out. Thank you. Stuart, there's a microphone you have to wait for, evidently. Since you're all being recorded. Um, could you say something about how, how much trouble people have to go to to get applications to, to work transparently? Like, I was most impressed with the, the document editor, because I'm thinking, well, you know, if you were taking a regular, something like Word, which doesn't start out running in a web browser, yeah. you don't have access to. So how, how would you do something like that? Okay, so... There, document editing is, is still an issue. I, we, have a, we wrote our own miniature document editor within, for Sage 2, entirely in JavaScript. We know it's, it's possible to do things like, a, like Google Docs, for example, or Microsoft, and also uh, um, uh, Mac, right? They all have cloud-based document editors now, right? These are all based entirely on JavaScript codes, right? So it's entirely feasible to actually port these into the Sage environment because all of Sage is actually just JavaScript. But Google ha does, doesn't make this stuff public. So we don't have control over that. And that's the only thing that's slowing us down. Right? But if you, if you want to, sh to look at a document in Sage, you can throw PDFs up there. You can also push multiples of your laptops up there and run regular browsers and... And, and, and PDF, uh, I'm sorry, and uh, Word and Excel and so forth, and still look at documents in that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could I ask another? Yeah. Um, uh, could you talk about what you use for, for interaction? So not just display, but you saw right. some of the demos right. showed people yeah. waving their so hands. And one, the, so one of the interaction, uh, uh, you know, interfaces for Sage is actually your touchpad on your laptop. So you can use your touchpad and you have a little pointer that you can move around. You can put a little name under your pointer. So when I teach my video game class, I will literally see a dozen pointers flying around the screen, you know, pointing at stuff, saying, well, what's this? I don't get it. Can you explain this? You know, sometimes it's a little chaotic, but it's kind of fun. The other thing is you can use your phone. So in fact, you can go to the Sage website with your, your phone, and there's an interface that lets you actually move the pointer using your phone and even upload documents and resize documents uh, from your phone. It's a little tiny, but it works. Um, but again, taking advantage of, of web technologies, you almost get that entirely for free. We just redesigned the interface slightly to make it easier to handle on a phone. Um, back in EVL, they have a uh, PlayStation controller, wireless with a tracker, and they use that as a virtual, as, as a, you know, pointer that they can use to move a pointer across the larger screen. So it's a little more natural, as it were. Yeah. Okay. Any other? Oh, another question down here. Wait um, for the mic, please. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, one quick one. So of the 160 
sites that have uh, Sage or Sage 2 systems, uh, for the most part, did those organizations build the tiled displays themselves? Yep. Did they follow like your spec online or are they hiring companies and like does Mechdyne yep. do this kind of thing? All of the above. All of the above. It really yeah. depends on the, on the institution. Some institutions could pay the extra overhead of hiring a company to put it all together. Uh, I think SADA in Amsterdam built their own for, at first. And then for the latest one, they actually contracted out to build this really glorious looking room with LED lighting on the floor and stuff like that. Nice. Um, but we also publish you know, uh, guidelines. You need this kind of computer with these kind of rough capabilities and this operating system. So yeah, we have a little cookbook. Yep. Okay. And uh, you keep like, um you have code control where, and do each of the institutions contribute code, yes. like with Cavern, and, and then you have one sort of production copy? Yes, yes. It's all, in, it's all in Git. Anybody can access it. It's all open software. And so we have more and more we're getting folks contributing code. Uh, I have one student who's visiting from Japan. He wants to do a streaming viewer. Uh, I think you might have heard him speak before at one of the uh, Synegrid meetings, uh, Donna. It's uh, uh, Kunakake Kaneko, who does um, content exp espresso for streaming uh, uh, forward error corrected 4K video streams. So we're going to try and get that into Sage 2 as well. Yep. In fact, as a little experiment to see how powerful a browser is, we took Node.js and wrote some code to see how much data we can pump through a browser, we are able to achieve 10 gigabits through a browser. So, uh, I, oh. Last question, Cinegrid, are oh, you sorry. working, is Sage and uh, Two and Cinegrid working together? Yes, absolutely. So Cinegrid is this uh, consortium of uh, researchers in computer science as well as the arts and uh, uh, film production like the film houses, like Paramount and Disney, who collaborate to understand you know, what are the challenges for film production and, uh, and uh, what are the, some of the research ideas are coming out of, of uh, computer science that could be applied to solving some of their problems. And if anyone's interested in data archival, that is the mother load of problems for the film industry. Yeah. And do you know what their best archival technology is for film? Film. It literally is film. Yeah. So my question is about, this is a beautiful technology because it's so flexible, right? So how do teams kind of interpret these things and how much work do you have to do to help them figure out how they can use the tools themselves? Right. So initially, yes, we do do a little bit of training, but, what, but it's become easier and easier because of the browser. So the way I do it now, I, I just... Uh, for example, the Institute for um, no, the, the Hawaii Space, the Hawaii Flight Space Flight Institute, uh, they had like twenty thousand dollars they had to spend on some environment. So they came to me and said, "We heard about this cyber canoe business. Can you can you, you know, explain this to us?" I said, "Well, bring your laptop, right? Because if I can get them running in five minutes." I know I can convince them that this, this will work for them. So I had them bring their laptop down. They had a Chrome browser. They had to install one Chrome plugin, and they were connected, and they were able to drop all their documents, images, PDFs, onto the Sage wall, control the pointer in five minutes. And they said, OK, we get this. We can imagine our classes being, being able to do this. Yeah, we, we struggled through that for, well, we've been doing it for over 10, 15 years, so we struggled through all those early yeah, issues. Can you describe how the, like, just how the video conferencing component of this works? Yeah. So for the video conferencing, there are several ways of doing it, but we primarily don't try to reinvent, reinvent the wheel because there are too many video conferencing solutions already out there, right? So we just take advantage of Google Hangout, right? It works really well. A lot of people use it, so why force them to use yet another tool? So I, for my cyber canoe, for example, um, when I teach the class, I don't know if you can see it, I will typically have the rightmost screen be, here we go, 
this is the rightmost screen. I typically have that be the dedicated video Google Hangout screen so they can see me and we can see the other class and the instructor. And these two are the Sage Walls. So the students from both sites have a perfectly mirrored experience. Anything a student drops into the wall will end up on both sides. Anything a student on each side points at, they'll be able to see on both sides with multiple pointers, multiple documents coming in and out uh, simultaneously. And you can even connect multiple sites together and they're perfectly mirroring these displays across all the sites. You know, this is the beauty of browser technologies. We didn't have to have, even have to write any of this code. It just almost came for free that we could do this. So if you're doing this and you're not doing browsers, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> I have a question. Yep, um, how did you come across the Arctic drilling workflow use case? Um, how we came, well, how we came th uh, across them was through collaborations with the lake drilling people. <laughs> so we, and that came across because we were working with um, uh, geology folks in Minnesota that wanted to use stereoscopic 3D to look at geological data sets, but they didn't want to spend a million dollars for a cave. This was back in 2000, and they said, well, I want a cave, but for $10,000. It's like, well, thanks. <laughs> So we built a, a, a projection screen with two PowerPoint projectors for 3D and a PC to drive it, and that was just when graphics cards were getting good enough. And they were starting using it. And then 500 of these were, were, were produced in all these various locations. And that's where the community started, started growing. And they said, well, do you have any other technologies for, say, this problem? And the core drilling problem was one of them, where they had a lot of high-resolution imagery and they would, once they scan these cores, they would never ever look at these physical things ever again. And they were, it was very difficult to actually look at the image data as well because it was just really clumsy. There was no archival way of doing it. And so that's how we got introduced to them for the late core. And then the late core introduced us to the ice core because it's the same, very similar kind of problem. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, so let's, uh, let's thank Jason again. Thank you. <clears throat> Great.